The coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease it causes COVID-19 have united us all in a global anxiety. And in the ED, as always, you are the masked warriors on the front line. So consider this video a novel resource as we dive deep into what we know so far, because by understanding how the virus is spread and exploring what makes it so deadly, you can keep yourself safe, treat your patients, and save the world. That's it. No big deal. Just the fate of the free world is at stake. Stay tuned at the end if you'd like to claim a free contact hour for continuing your education. What is known about this new coronavirus is being updated by the minute. So here's the current state as of March 22nd. First confined to China, despite aggressive isolation measures, the virus is spread worldwide. Why is it spread so quickly? There are a few reasons. One is that it is new, so populations don't have immunity, making it highly contagious. Two is that many people are asymptomatic or only have mild symptoms, making it easy to unwittingly transfer the infection. Three, recent lab testing shows the virus can linger in the air for over three hours and on surfaces for over two days, making it easy to pick up the virus unknowingly. And four, even asymptomatic people can shed the virus for over 22 days, making it near impossible to adequately quarantine everyone. Why is it so deadly? COVID-19 is even more deadly than the flu because it acts in a much more aggressive way. The flu triggers an overreaction of the immune system that then sets you up for a follow-on infection that can lead to septic arrest in those without much immune backup on reserve. In the same way, COVID-19 can be deadly by overtaxing our immune system, weakening it for a secondary infection. But it also directly attacks the cells of our lungs. The spikes on the outside of the virus, the same spikes that give it its regal crown, are tipped with a protein that acts as a key, allowing it to enter the lung cells. The virus then does two diabolical things. First, it hijacks the lung cell to make millions of copies of itself. These copies attack nearby cells and also end up in droplets that can be spread to new people. Second, it destroys its ability to produce surfactant. Surfactant is the slippery substance that allows the little air sacs, alveoli, in our lungs to stay open. Without surfactant, the surface area of our lungs dramatically decreases, and we can't exchange air into our bloodstream effectively. The insidious growth of the virus eclipses the lung's ability to work without sufficient surfactant, and suddenly the patient is in acute respiratory distress. All told, these factors mean that the majority of people will likely be infected, but only those without much respiratory reserve, such as the elderly, cancer patients, and other immunocompromised individuals, basically everyone we see in the ED, will be at the greatest risk for death. Looking at the impact on other countries, the stealthy spread of the infection initially created a false sense of security before the full scope of the outbreak was realized. By the time the first countries to be hit reacted, the spread had been so great that the sudden number of patients needing critical care overwhelmed their health systems. A friend who is an anesthesiologist shared an old story to illustrate the impact of exponential growth. Imagine a pond that starts with one lily pad. Each day, the number of lily pads doubles. Day two, there are two. Day three, there are four. Day four, there are eight, and so on. Until, on day 50, the entire surface of the pond is covered with lily pads. Now, on what day do you think the pond was half covered? The knee-jerk answer is that it would be around day 25. However, it was not day 25. It was not even day 40. It wasn't until the 49th day that the pond was half covered due to the compounding growth. The same effect has been seen in Italy, Iran, and South Korea, and even in Washington state. With the number of cases doubling every two to three days, what appeared to be an isolated problem was not recognized as having the potential to take over the pond until it was far too late. Compare that scenario to the rest of China outside of Hubei, the region where Wuhan is the capital. Every flat line represents a region of China where the government implemented immediate and drastic measures by the end of January, stopping the virus before it could spread. So what do we do? In the U.S., we are likely still in the silent incubation phase. Instead of echoing the remorse of Italy, Iran, and South Korea, 
we can adopt the strategy of early protective measures. Our goal, all of us in the world, is to hashtag flatten the curve, to minimize the impact by spreading out the infections over as long a time as possible. If transmission is allowed to progress undeterred, too many patients will present too fast and the finite capacity of hospitals will be overrun. The idea is to spread out the need for critical care so that the majority of us healthy people can develop our own immunity and isolation without spreading the virus to all the people who are at risk all at once. For us in the ED, that means a few things. In China, healthcare workers have been requiring hospitalization and critical care at higher rates than the population at large. This is probably because, especially early on when they were underprotected, they were exposed to large amounts of vir viral particles with high frequency. So it is especially important for you to reduce the amount of particles that can gain entry into your system. How do you do that? Great question. The virus is shielded by a lipid envelope. This oily surface can be destroyed by effective hand washing. Still gel in and gel out, but also constantly wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, like it's your job. Minimize contact with everyone, especially contact within six feet, and especially contact with any rule out patient. Avoid touching your face. The virus gets into your respiratory tract by entering your mouth, nose, or eyes. Don't touch these places. Leave your phone in the break room. You know that thing is dirtier than a gas station toilet seat. Snapgrams and tweet storms can wait. PPE is a precious commodity. Use it when you need it, but be mindful not to waste it. Slow your roll and plan to batch your assessment and specimen collection whenever possible. Aerosolizing procedures, such as intubation, should be done early to allow time to plan. Only anesthesia and experienced ED physicians should attempt to ensure first pass success. The team should be small, limited to the intubating physician who will perform a video laryngoscopy, the assisting physician who administers drugs and assists with intubation. RT is in the room to manage the vent, and a safety RN can stand outside the room to prepare meds and ensure proper PPE protocol is followed and the team stays safe for the next case. And use excessively careful procedures for donning and doffing. Highlights here are to perform hand hygiene between every step. The last thing off should be your mask. Avoid touching the outside of it. That's where all the viral particles will be. Our understanding of this virus is ever-changing, and our supply chain is under duress. So, for the most current PPE requirements, refer to organizational policies. If you are sick, stay home. Avoid people and wear a mask if you must be near others. This way, you avoid sharing your shed viral particles with anyone that might not have the immune prowess that you do. It cannot be emphasized enough. Every extra day we minimize the spread is an exponential reduction in the number of patients we'll be seeing two weeks from now. Do everything you can today so that the coming flood is a rising tide at our feet and not a crashing wave that knocks us off of them. To fight the inundation, we also need to educate our patients, family, and friends. Evangelize the following. Avoid public places. Stay at home. Buy things online. Don't go to stores. There's nothing there anyway. Yes, that includes Target. Wash your hands. The virus can persist on surfaces for a long time. Soap and water kills it. Wash your phone at least once a day. If you're sick, wear a mask. If you're sick, stay at home. If you're sick and start to have trouble breathing, go to the ED right away. These interventions are not forever, just for a few weeks. You, the ED staff, are the most critical resource. Ventilators can't run themselves, and no one knows how to cram a swab up a nose like you do. You must be the mask warrior, keeping yourself safe so that when the flood of patients comes, you are able to care for them and save lives. If you have questions, and you undoubtedly will, as things are in a constant evolution, reach out to your friendly ED educator or your management team. If you'd like a free contact hour for watching this video, review the journal article linked in the description. Then send an email to free at certrn.com. Click show more below this video for full details. Discharge. Let's go.